I guess we can get started just about uh, 15 or so after. We we're just so happy to, Johannes Strobel is with us today back at Stanford, so to speak. He's not really at Stanford, but he's as if he's at Stanford, that's all that matters. And we have good memories of his being around here for many years. But uh, he's gonna speak about a new, very innovative uh, topic, social capital in the United States measurement determinants and association with economic mobility. Johannes is now at NYU, uh, David Lowe Professor of Finance at, at NYU at the Leonard, at the Leonard School, CERN School. And we just saw uh, this is a paper uh, which has been circulated. It's just out today, which is quite exciting. And there's a New York Times piece about it, which we circulated as well. And uh, it's, it's with uh, Raj and Matt Jackson and Teresa Fiddler. So it's just uh, terrific. So I, I uh, indicated to Johannes uh, that he could speak pretty much interrupted for half hour, 45 minutes or so. But if you have questions of clarification, uh, whatever, just jump in and you know, you could raise your mechanical hand or just shout. And then we'll have time uh, at, towards the end for questions and answers. But uh, I don't want to interrupt Johannes anymore. And uh, welcome, welcome back to Stanford, Johannes. Thank you very much, John. Um, it, it's a real pleasure to be at this group. I actually want to start on a brief personal note um, because, as as many of you might not know, um, when I was a graduate student at Stanford, and John was my uh, my, my main advisor. Um, I had what I still describe today as the best graduate student job there is in the world, which was I was um, the, the, the graduate student scribe, so to say, um, in the very early incarnations of this group. I think John set this up just in the aftermath of the financial crisis. And it was just a really exciting period. It was much smaller than it is today. It was meeting you know, in the George Schultz conference room at Hoover that many of you have seen, sort of a very impressive room um, you know, in of itself. And you know, it was just a, you know, a small number of people trying to make sense of the financial crisis in real time, um, trying, you know, off the record discussions, trying to figure out what's going on as the world around us was changing very much. So I was extremely privileged at the time to be, you know, a, a very small part of this and just really just to watch this, um, you know, and, and, and learn from it. And it was really a formative experience for me. So it's a true privilege to be back and to be invited back to this group and, you know, 10 years later and share some of my, my own research um, you know, and uh, you know, as as John's mentioned, um, this is a research project we've worked about, uh, we've worked um, on for a very long period of time, and um, you know, I'd love to get your feedback. I'd love to get your comments, and um, you know, so I'll uh, I look forward to to those discussions. You know. This is a very large team of um, collaborators for, and particularly for an economics project. So I maybe want to spend just the first minute or two just kind of giving a little bit of context of how this sort of group, and particularly this group of PIs came about. So as John has mentioned, this is joint work with, you know, Raj Shetty at Harvard and Opportunity Insights, you know, your own colleague, Matt Jackson at Stanford, and, you know, my, my colleague, Teresa um, at NYU and me. And, um, what we're trying to do in this in this uh, in this project is trying to you know study the role that social capital has in terms of driving economic upward mobility in the United States and trying to understand those relationships. And, you know, we started this project about five years ago. And, um, you know, as many of you know, Raj and his team at Opportunity Insights have spent a lot of time over the past, you know, 10 years, really thinking hard about the role and the determinants of economic opportunity and upward economic mobility in the United States. And so they'd spend a lot of time documenting large spatial variation in upward income mobility. So the probability that, you know, kids from poor families rise up in the income distribution. They found large spatial variation, but one of the things that was always sort of in the background here is why is this the case? Why are some neighborhoods so much better at fostering economic mobility than others? And one of the things that they kept hearing as you know, they were talking to other researchers, but also to community leaders, et cetera, on the ground, was that this concept of social capital was something 
that was very important. And sort of in parallel, Teresa and I had been working together with you know, Mike Bailey and other researchers at Facebook for the last decade, really trying to understand the role that um, social networks have on a whole range of economic and social outcomes, you know, things like your beliefs about the future, how they are affected by your network, by your peers around us. And as you guys know well, Matt Jackson is sort of the leading authority in the theoretical space on economic networks. And so given that we'd also spent the last 10 years circling this question of how do networks affect economic outcomes and whether or not they can really lead you know, to economic opportunities for people, we decided to team up a few years ago and you know, really try and work on this question together. And you know, over time, we've worked with lots of research assistants, lots of pre-doctoral fellows, et cetera, that, um, you know, who are all co-authors on this project as well. So what are we trying to do in this project? Again, you know, the starting point was this observation that many outcomes are often said to be dependent on this sort of notion of social capital. But what do we actually mean by social capital? And is it something that we can measure at scale? What effect does it have and how do we increase it? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, you know, take this sort of relatively a vague notion of social capital and try and structure it into a range of categories that you can actually measure. I mean, when we started this project early on, very quickly we realized that when different people talk about social capital, they actually mean very, very different things. And so, you know, we said, well, in order to now measure it and be precise about it, we have to kind of categorize the very variety of things that people um, that people have in mind. And so we, you know, we measure these three things, connectedness, cohesiveness, and, and civic engagement. I'll talk a little bit more about what each of these notions of social capital is. Um, we'll then try and measure each of these concepts across US geographies and US institutions using de-identified data from Facebook. And I'll talk a little bit more about the data as well. And then what we're going to do is we're going to explore the relationship um, of social capital with one key outcome, economic mobility. It's not the only outcome we care about. And in fact, you know, some of the patterns that we find in terms of the relationship between some of these notions of social capital and economic mobility might well look very different when you're trying to look at other outcomes, you know, other things that you might be interested in. Um, we're going to have two kind of key headline results. And I'll again, be very precise about um, you know, each of them and build up to them throughout the presentation. Um, but the first key result is that we show that a, you know, a notion of social capital that we call economic connectedness. But it's basically a measure of how connected poor people are to rich people in a given neighborhood is the best predictor of economic mobility, both better than some of the other social capital measures that we're going to measure, but also actually a better predictor than almost anything that people found in 15 years of research of sort of quantitatively trying to study um, upward economic mobility. Um, and so then with sort of that specific understanding in mind that you know this idea of economic connectedness, how much are poor people linked to rich people, um, you know, potentially influencing the ability of poor people to rise up in the income distribution. Um, we then in the second sort of project, try and understand variation in economic connectedness. What, why are some areas richer in this type of social capital than others? Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to decompose it into two types of, you know, two contributors. One of them is exposure, right? So in areas where Poor people are just surrounded more by rich people in their communities. It's easier to make rich friends. And the second one is what we call friending bias. You know, how much are you, how likely are you to befriend a given person in a given community, in your high school, in, in, in your, you know, in your college, in your churches, et cetera. Um, and what we'll do is we'll study differences in economic connectedness, but also the drivers, exposure and friending bias within specific institution and really try and understand what is it about a given high school, a given neighborhood, et cetera, that makes it have, be relatively rich or relatively poor in terms of economic connectedness. So I want to First, talk a little bit more about these different types of social capital and what different people have in mind and what it is that we can and cannot measure in the data, um, and then walk you through the rest of the paper. So again, after sort of a broad survey of the types of things that people had referred to in the past as social capital, um, we came up with sort of three broad concepts um, of social capital that you know, we think we can measure in the data. The first is what we call economic connectedness. It's sometimes also called bridging social capital. And the idea here is that within a community, it is the extent of links that people have to different 
people, people that are different to themselves. So this could be how much, you know, how connected low income people are to high income people, or how much non-native English speakers are connected to native English speakers. So it's, you know, the extent of connections across sort of individuals of different groups. Why do we think that this might be an important measure of social capital? Um, there's a large literature, um, you know, starting with Glenn Lowry and, and you know, and, and others in, in sociology that have kind of highlighted that these links and particular links that poor people might have to relatively richer people can be really important in terms of fostering their aspirations, um, in terms of providing them with information, um, in terms of providing them with opportunities, job referrals, et cetera, something like that. So there's a lot of mechanisms that we might think of that, um, you know, that sort of allow, uh, you know, that, that, that make us think that potentially these types of links could be something that might be driving, you know, an outcome such as economic connectedness, uh, such as economic mobility. Um, John, I see you have your hand up. Just a, a quick question, because it might inform how you talk about things going forward. Uh, for everybody who moves up a quintile, somebody else has to move down a quintile. Mm -hmm. are, are you also going to look at mobility in the opposite direction? And in particular, do rich people who move down uh, quintiles, is that because of exposure to poor people? Or is that just because they're kind of nudniks among the rich? Yeah, or, it's a and, very, and, sorry, yeah, it's sorry, a good, and, and that question as we go forward. Yeah, no, it's a very good question, John. So the, the way we measure people's position is within the national income distribution, right? So it is possible within a given community for everybody to move up in the national income distribution without people within that community having to move down. Sort of that aggregation result that for everybody moving up, someone else has to move down is true at a national scale, but not at a community level scale. There is an interesting sort of question in, in, in where you're at, which is sort of this result we have that when low income people are more connected to high income people, they move up in the national income distribution. What does it mean to the, you know, to the, to the outcomes of high income people when they're more connected with low income people? Does that make them move down in the income distribution? And one of the things that we find is that in particular, once you condition on say the resources in a neighborhood, um, what you're going to find is that the extent of you know, poor friends amongst rich people has no more predictive power for their future economic mobility. That is not true unconditionally. Unconditionally, it is that if you grow up rich, with more poor friends unconditionally, you are going to be relatively worse off going forward. But that's largely because these are people who live in relatively poorer neighborhoods with less good schools, fewer resources on other dimensions. Once you hold that fixed and you just look at variation in links, conditional on resources, you're still going to get upward mobility for the poor people without any downward mobility for the rich people as a result of these cross-class connections. So some, some of what we're calling upward mobility is whole neighborhoods that are moving up relative to the national distribution. That uh, is exactly up. right. That is exactly okay. right. And, and it's going to be because the, the poor people move up without the rich people moving down in the national distribution. And so the entire neighborhood will move up. That's exactly right. And other neighborhoods will move down. So I'm, I'm, I always As a result. Like okay, yes. sorry for interrupting. Go for yeah. it. No, not at all. It's a good question. And I think it's an important one. And I, you know, it's kind of a key result, I think, you know, in addition to providing the upward mobility, the links by themselves don't make, you know, having more links to low income people doesn't make the high income people worse off. Okay, so then the budget constraint. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, but at the national level, I think that's exactly right. You're exactly right at the national level, but community by community, you can make your whole community better off. And, you know, in some sense, there is an aspect here, which is, do you only care about relative positions in the income distribution, right? So even if, you know, even if everybody moves up in absolute terms, but not in relative terms, you know, that might, you know, it, it could be that the other communities aren't any worse off in absolute terms, but you're better off in relative terms, right? So in some sense, the, the question, you know, we're measuring this here as relative position in the income distribution, but I wouldn't worry about the budget constraint quite as much because what we really care about is absolute outcomes for people rather than relative outcomes. Otherwise, we could stop doing anything about how, how making people better off because you always have someone in the hundredth percentile and why would we care if they're rich or poor? Or, you know, it, it, so, so I think that's kind of the way I view this. The budget constraint is really one about, about relative terms, but what we care about is absolute outcomes. So the second type of social capital that people quite often have in mind is something that, you know, is also called bonding social capital, which is the idea of the tightness of connections at a local level. And the central thing here is that it doesn't really matter whom you're connected to with, right? It just matters about how tight your connections are. So for example, one 
measure of this type is what people call clustering. So clustering is just a share of my friends that happen to be friends with each other, right? We have a very clustered network if everybody's friends with everybody and you have a very a much less dense network if you know people are sort of friends with random people that then don't have sort of further friendships into the cliques. And again, there's sort of a lot of theory literature that makes you think that this type of clustering might be important for driving economic mobility or for driving outcomes in general. So Coleman, you know, in the 80s had pointed out that sort of these networks that are very dense, they allow sort of you to, to sustain cooperation through favor exchange type mechanisms. You know, if, if, you know, if I'm friends with, you know, both John Taylor and John Cochran and I che cheat John Cochran, then John Taylor will punish me because they're all friends with each other. Um, you know, but if, you know, John, John Taylor and John Cochran weren't friends with each other, you know, this type of sustaining of, you know, informal relationships wouldn't work. Um, so that's a second type of social capital measure that people sometimes have in mind um, and that, that you know, we will try and measure in the data. And then the last one is sort of one that doesn't actually depend on any you know, information about people's networks. It's you know, what we're going to call civic engagement, but it is sort of an amorphous mix of trust, culture, norms, the functionings of institutions. This is the early idea of Putnam's you know, concepts uh, of, of, of social capital. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to try and measure this in two ways. One of them is we're going to try and measure this in terms of, you know, rates of volunteering in a community, um, you know, and we're going to try and measure that by the fraction of the populations who are members of, you know, Facebook groups that are dedicated to volunteering and also the density of civic organizations in the neighbor. And I'll talk a little bit more about the measurement, but broadly speaking, these are the three types of, of, of concepts, connectedness, which is a bridging social capital, cohesiveness, which is a bonding social capital, and then civic engagement, which is really about, you know, trusts and norms and something like that. Very brief note on the data. So this is a you know this research project um, you know with the, the, that has you know a large number of co-authors is a collaboration with uh, Facebook or uh, now Meta, but we're working largely um, with the Facebook app um, because in some sense one of the biggest problems this large literature you know on social capital has had in the past is that as a concept it is extremely hard to measure. It's extremely hard to at scale quantify what a given community's social capital might might be. And so um, what you really need to do that is you need you need network data and um, you know and, and Facebook being sort of you know at least for certain population ranges, we're going to look at people aged 25 to 44, sort of a population scale measure of real world networks. And so and we were very grateful that uh, you know Facebook agreed to collaborate with us, on this research effort and so we can work with the identified data on Facebook users. Again, we're going to focus on active users um, aged between 25 and 44. We have about 72.2 million such users. So in that age range, we have coverage of about 84% of the population. Um, so we're really, you know, essentially dealing with the population scale network. Overall, we have 21 billion you know, friendship links in this data set. So this is, you know, probably the largest sort of social network data set studied specifically for this question of trying to measure social capital. Um, and then in addition, you know, and so what do we, what do we observe in this de-identified and, and, you know, and, and, and privacy protected data? We obviously observe friendships um, between individuals. We observe some amounts of demographics. We observe some information on group memberships. So, you know, people self-report which high school they went to, which college they went to, et cetera. It's going to allow us to study social capital for every high school in the U.S., for every college in the U.S. Um, we have some good information on, on geography, and we have some information that allows us to link individuals to their parents in this data set. Um, this got an important aspect here that I talked about, right? I've kind of mentioned this, you know, said this like, you know, rich versus poor. What we're really trying to measure in the data um, where we don't observe individual income is some sort of notion of socioeconomic status. And I'm going to go back and forth between high socioeconomic status, which is quite a mouthful. I'm going to just use rich and poor just as sort of stand-ins for this. But what we're actually going to do in practice in the data is we're going to combine 22 different proxies um, for socioeconomic status. So the average income in the zip code you live in, um, things like the type of phone that you use, which college you went to, et cetera, et cetera. And in our baseline, what we're going to do is we're going to combine these measures to best predict medium household income in a census block group where the individual lives. And you know what we're going to do is we're going to rank users in the national income distribution. Um, this is sort of a complex procedure to estimate SCS, 
What turns out is in the end, it really doesn't matter how you do it. So you get very, very similar results. For example, if you just define or you just proxy for someone's socioeconomic status with the average income in the zip code they live in, and you just leave it at that and you forget about all of these other measures, right? So just to kind of, this is not some sort of artifact of the type that we measure it. We spend a lot of time verifying that all of the results we have are extremely robust to various ways of measuring socioeconomic status. So this is the first sort of graph of results um, that we have. And this is not, this is sort of aggregate level of, you know, what the economists call homophily, the probability that you're friends with people who are similar to you. So what we're plotting here on the horizontal axis is an individual's own SES percentile rank. And that naturally goes from zero to hundred in the national income distribution. And then on the Y axis, we're gonna plot the mean SES rank of someone's friends. So basically what you see is that someone sort of the, the poorest people in the country, their friends on average are at the 30th percentile of the income distribution, while you know, the richest people in the country, their friends are on average at the 80th or even above percentile of the income distribution. So you can really see that on average, people are friends with others of you know, pretty similar incomes. Um, what I'm, what I'm showing in the yellow here, which looks near identical to the green line, is when we just, rather than looking at all Facebook friends, we're really just looking at the top 10 friends that each individual has. And you find very, very similar results, suggesting that, you know, again, sort of any concerns that you might have about, you know, are Facebook friendships real friends? Are they really representative of, of, of sort of true networks? Um, I think we can address pretty confidently. And interestingly, these aggregate patterns are also similar to survey-based measures of aggregate homophily we have from a survey called the At Health Survey, which is a survey of about 20,000 high school students um, where you know, they, they elicit those students' networks and they have some demographics on their parents. The slope of you know, own rank to, uh, to, to friends rank is very, very similar in that data set. Um, the beauty of our data, obviously, is that we don't just have 20,000 know, data points here. We have you know, many, many million data points. And so we can dig down much, much more beyond just this sort of aggregate pattern that I'm showing you here, but I'm starting out with that. And I think we spend a lot of time at least verifying that the aggregate patterns look very similar to sort of other more survey-based, smaller um, data sets where similar aggregate patterns have been collected. Do you know where people work and are using that for, to produce uh, uh, income? I just, that's also where people get the, a lot of their friends. Yeah, so, so um, on employer, we, we have some information for some people, but because it all has to be self-reported and it is not one of the most heavily um, populated fields on people's Facebook profiles. So we're going to, I'm going to show, we're going to look at, at, you know, workplaces as one of the settings where people make friends, exactly as you point out, because it is where people make friends, but it is not sort of sufficiently well populated for us to be able to use that very strongly in our SES predictions. Unfortunately, that would have been, uh, would have been as for the reasons you point out, something very useful for us. So what I then, what I now want to do is I want to go and look at how sort of this this, you know, this rate of poor and rich people being friends with each, with each other varies across space. And in order to do that, I have to go away from this sort of, you know, complex rank rank graph. And I'm going to go into a two dimensional measure of what we're going to call economic connectedness, which is we're going to split individuals in each neighborhood into those that are in the bottom half of the national income distribution and those in the top half of the national income distribution. And then we're going to measure their economic connectedness as twice the percentage of their friends that are in the top half of the national income distribution. So let me just kind of go concretely here. For individuals who are in the bottom half of the national income distribution, 39% of their friends are in the top half. And so that gives you an economic connectedness of twice that, so 0 0.78. On the flip side, for people in the, you know, in the top half of the national income distribution, 70% of their friends are again themselves in the top half of the national income distribution. And so that gives you an economic connectedness of about 1.4. What we're gonna look at now is um, economic connectedness, which is sort of this green bar here and how that varies across space and how that spatial variation in the beginning just correlates. And later on, we'll try and see how far we can get in terms of making causal claims. Um, but to start out with just, you know, with how variation in this green bar, the share of above you know, median um, SES friends among the low median SES individuals, how that varies across space and how that's predictive of, um, of economic mobility. Um, so this is, you know, just gives you a map 
of how economic connectedness varies across the US. Um, it's a county level map. And so one of the things, you know, again, what we're measuring here is this normalized share of above median SES friends among below median SES individuals. And so, you know, some of the things you see is that obviously the Southeast and the Southwest have relatively low economic connectedness. Low income people in these neighborhoods are not friends with many high income individuals, but that's sort of the Midwest you know, and, and all the way into Utah, um, you know, has, has, has very high levels of economic connectedness. Also, um, the, you know, uh, some parts of the Northeast have relatively high um, degrees of economic connectedness. California is a bit of a mixed bag. Um, you know, I, I, it, it doesn't really, you know, stick out as a particularly, you know, as an area of particular high economic connectedness. Um, this, beyond this variation, yes, John. This is not, you have a map of where there are rich people. I mean, there's just not many rich people in Fresno, so it's impossible yeah. to be connected with other rich people. Yes, you're completely right. So one of the things, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in, in, in a handful of slides, is that, you know, as I said before, what are sort of the two determinants we have in terms of driving economic mobility, in terms of driving economic connectedness? One is this exposure. Are there any rich people around even? You know, if there are no rich people around, you can't make friends with rich people. Um, and, and that's partly what's reflected in this map, but it's not the only thing that's reflected in this map. And I'll kind of really hone in on that second point, that conditional on how many rich people there are around, we're still going to find large differences in economic connectedness across space, which doesn't quite come out as striking in this map. And so I'll have a different way of showing that, um, that I think makes that second point more striking. Why, why you're so interested in being connected to people in the national ranking, uh, being connected to the local rich guy would seem to make a lot of sense in some sense, because we're, we're almost different, uh, different country, different countries here. Yeah, so I think that I mean I do think that is an interesting question. I, I, you know, I, there is if you go to the extreme, a place where everybody is extremely poor, and then there's one person who owns earns ten dollars more, just being connected to that person still doesn't get you know still doesn't get you the aspirations, the information, the mentorship, the job opportunities, or something like that. Now, in some sense, it's probably somewhere in the middle. Um, we decided to go um, for the national income distribution. Um, also in part because a lot of these links are actually to non-local people. I'll show you that in a bit too, right? We kind of think of, mo you know, of, uh, of these friendships being largely driven by local people. But if you go to a place like San Francisco, a large number of your friends you know, live more than 500 miles away. This is something Teresa and I documented in an earlier piece of research. We called it the social connectedness index. And we looked at the extent of connections between every pair of counties in the US and really showed that you know, while yes, there are some counties in say Kentucky where 93% of your friends live within hundred miles, there are other places like San Francisco where that number might only be 30 or 40%, right? So, you know, it's, it's just not clear what the right sort of measure is. And so we decided to go for the national income distribution in terms of ranking. No, no, Hannes, can I jump in here? The, yes, please, Steve. There, there, there's a reductionist aspect of this that uh, I find somewhat troubling. I mean, it's certainly true on average that rich people probably ha uh, have values that promote upward mobility more than poor people, but there's enormous variation in that. And, and you know, the prototypical example that comes to mind are um, immigrant refugees who were there, the elites of where they came from, but start out very poor in the United States. And yet they mm -hmm. have a history of, of promoting upward mobility among their children. And one suspect mm -hmm. it's not because they're rich, it's because they're successful at instilling certain values that are helpful in becoming rich. Right. And I would, is it not possible to take the Facebook textual data and instead of characterizing people by and places by how rich they are, but characterize people by the attitudes that they express towards personal responsibility, perseverance, the value of education and so on. I, at some level, I think that's what's that's what you're probably picking up here. And, yeah. and rich is just it just drives it drives all the the thinking towards oh we just gotta we just gotta make give people more income and then we'll put them in higher income places and then that's the secret whereas I don't think that's the secret. Yeah, I mean I think there's two parts. So first of all, I don't think the policy conclusion is just going to be put people in higher income places. I think it's going to be put them there and then also get them to interact with the higher income people. But put that aside, I think I think your uh, you know I think your intuition is kind of aligns with at least one of the three mechanisms. The sort of people have in mind of why this 
measure of economic connectedness might matter. Um, you know, it, it, it's the aspirations aspect and the values component. And I do agree with you that income is, is, is at best an imperfect proxy. Of, 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 of those values, those aspects. Um, what's been really fascinating actually throughout the day for me is kind of, you know, as the New York Times put out its sort of, you know, summary of our research um, has this comment section. And, you know, a lot of people were kind of, you know, in, in, that, in that comment section just saying like, this is my experience and here's the various ways that these types of links help me. And I do think values is one of them. So, you know, this idea, you know, I got taught, but my rich friends taught me what was possible kind of repeatedly showing up in that comment section of people just relaying their own personal stories. Um, but also information is a central part, right? You know, I went to my parents at my friend's house for dinner and I heard for the first time that I had to take the SAT, it was showing up once or twice there, right? Um, and then, you know, beyond that, just like, you know, my friend's dad got me my first internship or my first job and that put me on the right track, et cetera. So I don't think it is just values. It is also sort of, you know, access to certain type of information and certain you know, resources like job opportunities that you know, wealthier people are more likely to be able to provide. Um, and so we can't separate which of these three mechanisms it is. Um, but I do agree with Johannes, you that, Johannes, I, that I think it's at best an imperfect proxy. See, I'm missing a theory section. Usually we have a theory and, and you mentioned that there are, there's a lot of theoretical work, um, right. even, especially at Stanford. Um, but, but usually the measurement thing, the measurement uh, pops out of theory. But it seems like we're, you're, you're just you're just sort of um, there's no theory. <laughs> there's yeah, no I theory mean, guiding. Is that right? Yes. But well, uh, Bob, it's it's the beauty of no longer formally being a macroeconomist, I guess, that I can get away presenting no. <laughs> presenting a paper with no theory. No, but but joking aside, I, I I do think there is a lot of theory in the background here. In fact, I think this is a field where theory has come before measurement for decades, precisely because it was impossible to measure all of these. So Glenn Lowry's 1977 paper on you know, on, on upward income mobility is a theory paper that shows exactly how access to, you know, more well-positioned people does well. Um, these cohesiveness measures that I talked about, clustering, et cetera, um, you know, Matt Jackson, as you know well, has written lots of theory papers proposing measures like spectral homophily as a great measure of, you know, the, the speed at which information passes through a community. There's a lot of graph theorists, a lot of people that are way better mathematicians than I am, that have put forward lots of theories why each of these measures might be what's going on. And so I think the contribution of this work is not to innovate in terms of coming up with more different theories of why each of these things might matter, but it's instead saying, okay, you know, we now have 15 theories for 15 different measures of social capital. Um, and we haven't really been able to differentiate in a meaningful way which one matters, which one does not. In fact, most of them we've never been able to measure at scale before. And so it feels like that is sort of the, the relative contribution of this work and why we focus this paper to be, um, to be you know, largely a, a, in an empirical paper. Though, if you do want to see theory, you, 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 trust me, Matt Jackson has made sure we have a, have a good theory section in the paper. It's just, I don't feel that's where the contribution lies and therefore I don't want to spend most of my presentation on that. Johan, if I could throw in just for a second, as a sociologist, the classic theory paper on this is uh, your Stanford uh, faculty member, Mark Granovetter's The Strength of Weak Ties. That's exactly he laid right. out the theory very clearly that the, having a large diffuse number of contacts in different communities and a variegated network gives you more employment opportunities and more diverse information than having a relatively closed and homogenous network. And that was decades ago. So I think in the sociology network research, there really are extensive theoretical and empirical studies of how the variety and shape of uh, personal networks extends into opportunities for employment and mobility. It's just we've never had anything like this astounding volume of data to check it out. Granovetter is, is close to the top of candidates for the Nobel Prize in Economics. That's right. <laughs> And you know, together, together with Matt and 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 you know, and many others who've been pushing that theory. Thank you, Jack. That's a yeah, you're exactly right. So I I think we're not moving in a theoryless space here. I think we're building on, as you point out, decades of you know hard thinking, 
across fields, you know, anywhere from graph theory all the way to sociology with economics probably somewhere in the middle of sort of justifying thinking about why these different things measure. And again, I think the, the, the relative value add of our exercise is to bring data to try and quantify these different concepts to trying to document, you know, how they how they work. Okay. So this is a, this is again the map of you know this economic connectedness measure across the U.S. But you know we have enough granularity in our data to go down to the zip code level, so we can measure all of these social capital measures cool. down to the individual zip code. And so here, you know, just as an example, we're plotting um, you know we're plotting LA, um, you know, and 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 again you can see that. You know, while there's large differences across space, you know, across the entire U.S. in terms of economic connectedness, there are also huge differences across, um, you know, across neighborhoods within metro areas. Um, you know, not just in, in in economic connectedness, which is what I'm showing here, but also in volunteering rates, in the density of civic institutions, in network clustering, and all of these other, you know, measures that are highlighted above. Um, you know, this is really just to kind of highlight that this is a very ends up being a very rich data set, and as a result, we can make some progress in the direction of really trying to understand the effects that these different types of social capital measures have. So this is what I want to do in this graph here. So this graph here is, you know, in this in this stage, just a purely correlational graph. And what we want to do is, for in, in in the first sort of as a in the first time in, in in this presentation, really trying to link again at this stage in a correlational sense, economic connectedness, that variation in economic connectedness across across space on the horizontal axis, against um, economic mobility. On the vertical axis. Just a little aside here, what do we do for economic mobility? We basically build on Raj and co-authors earlier work using tax data where they measured um, you know, the predicted national household income rank for children whose parents were at the 25th percentile of the national income distribution. Right, so um, so you know how far up in the income distribution do poor kids rise up to in the end? And you know, Raj, as, as I noted early on, you know, in co-authors they found large spatial variation in that. And what we're going to try and see is how closely that spatial variation in economic mobility correlates with spatial variation in economic connectedness. I think the headline takeaway is that it correlates extremely strongly. So what you can see is you can see that, you know, across all counties, it has a correlation of about 0.65. And what you can see is that, you know, you have places like Minneapolis and Salt Lake City, where, you know, about half of a poor person's friends are rich on average, right? So economic connectedness of one means about half of a poor person's friends are rich. Um, you know, you, you contrast that with places like Indianapolis, where only about 30% of a poor person's friends are rich on average. Um, and you find, you can just see the sort of very strong um, correlation um, between sort of this, you know, specific measure of, of, of social capital, economic connectedness, and this outcome that sort of has motivated us and, 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 and many others, um, and presumably many on this call, been really trying to think, how do we get the American dream back alive? How can we make it like what are the types of things we need to do in order for people who grow up in poor families to have at least the opportunities to rise up the income distribution. Um, so this is the graph for economic connectedness. Um, what I'm showing you here is univariate correlations between all the different measures of social capital that we construct. Those are the lined up on the, on the vertical axis. And again, that univariate correlation with upward income mobility across counties. And so the first thing you can see is again, this sort of 0.65 correlation, positive correlation between economic connectedness and upward mobility. But the other thing that you see is that all of the other social capital measures that we construct have essentially no correlation with this outcome of upward mobility that we care about. That is due to the fact that they're actually fairly uncorrelated across space. This was sort of, in some sense, one of the most interesting first findings we had, right? So when we started out saying, well, look, different people mean different things when they say social capital. One of the takeaways then was like, you know, is that an issue? You know, is it, you know, because it could well have been that the same places where economic connectedness is high is also the places where clustering is high and is also the places where volunteering rates are high. But it actually turns out that those are very different parts of the US. And so as a result, this distinction is really a meaningful one. Um, we spend a lot of time just verifying that this sort of raw um, correlations that you, uh, you know, yes. that, that Quick, these univariate, just one sec, and these univariate correlations, you know, that they hold, 
you know, multivariate correlation analysis that they hold within, you know, across zip codes. This is an across county analysis. Um, just one thing I want to say before I go to John's question is I really don't want you guys to take away that out of all of these different concepts of social capital, one is the right one, one is the meaningful one, and all others are sort of bad or wrong or noise or whatever. I think it's quite the opposite. I think which notion of social capital matters strongly depends on the outcome that you study. And in fact, we've looked at other outcomes. You know, they're sort of in the appendix because it's already a long paper. But we show, for example, that if you look at life expectancy, it's actually some of these network cohesiveness measures, the density of your network, that ends up mattering much more than if you, uh, you know, than, um, than um, you know, it, it, it uh, you know, than it does for economic mobility, right? So I think the key takeaway here is if you talk about social capital, you got to be precise about what you mean because those different concepts are not the same. And you can have communities that are rich in one type of social capital, but might be poor in another type of social capital. And so given that, um, given that that's the case, it's really important to be precise about what it is you have in mind. John, I've uh, kept you waiting. Just a clarification. So your upward mobility has to be from 20 years ago to now, but your, right. your connection data is now. So right. what you're showing is that people are now connected in places where a lot of people got rich, not yes. connections at day T forecast mobility ah. to the day T plus 20, right? This is a very good point, which is, ah. that, that's right. That is, that, that's, okay. that's exactly right. So, so far, this is just a correlation. Um, and, um, you know, in this paper, there are limits to how far we can go in terms of making causal claims. You don't really randomly vary someone's social network around in a meaningful way. Um, but what we can do is we can try and think through a range of some of the most obvious non-causal explanations for the patterns we find in the data and see if they hold any merit, see if they go anywhere. And so, you know, John Cochran's already hit on the first one, which is some sort of measure of reverse causality, right? So imagine in a given place, everybody's poor and they're friends with each other in high school, and then some become rich later. Those are the places with lots of economic mobility. And those are then also the places where their friends that remain poor now have lots of links to rich people. But it's not that they, you know, that they, and, you know, that, that it's, those links that caused people to be rich. There was something that led to high upward mobility in these places. And, you know, subsequently you got, um, you know, you got higher degrees of economic connectedness. So but aren't you getting, aren't you getting um, uh, the same variable on both the X and the Y axis? I mean, it looks to me like this is sort of an artificially high correlation because your, your two measures are very, you're almost using the same kind of information to construct the the two variables that you're relating to one another. So can you put, put the slide back up there that shows the yeah so that very one, that, high relationship? Yeah. yeah, so that one I want to understand a bit better because you know while while both of them are broadly related to income. The economic mobility measure is one about across gen generation moves in income. So it's, you know, someone who's rich, like, you know, someone who grew up with poor parents, how rich are they today? Well, the economic connectedness that we've constructed is a within generation across individual Yeah, types but if you've got links. a part of the country, which in the national distribution is already rich, and, and mm -hmm. parts of the country, like such as the Northeast and mm -hmm. the West Coast, you yes. have a high density of rich people there already. And yes. so you're bound to get that that very high connection between these two variables. That's right. So I think this comes back to John's question. I think that is not related to necessarily related to economic mobility being problematically correlated, but it is like, uh, is all that you're picking up just variation in income in rich places? You know, people um, people have lots of rich friends, and is this so? Are we just picking up that you know places with lots of rich people have more economic mobility? And I want to just delay that question just three slides because it's a really or, important. Or maybe one. income has a different meaning in these areas than other other places. That is to say, it's it's not just sort of inflation, but quality of life can vary a lot from one part of the country to another uh, for people who have. Uh, a particular level of income. So, so the, the very high income you're observing in New York City may not give you the quality of life that you would get in say Rapid City, South Dakota. So, yeah. you, but you're, you're gonna show lower 
connectedness in Rapid City than you are in yeah. So I think this comes back again to New John's York question about Francisco. about relative versus absolute positioning, right? So someone who's 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 high in the in the local income distribution but low in the national income distribution might still have a high quality of life because cost of living might be cheaper in these places. Um, so for that, I'm just going to go back to my answer for John uh, that, that I gave to John. I think, you know, there's good arguments to go both ways. I think we, you know, there's good arguments to try and measure relative positioning in the local income distribution, but what's local is just very different and how much local matters differs a lot across space. And I think that, you know, that, that, that's been sort of a source of issue in what we've been doing here. Um, let me get back to your other point and just, as I said, two slides, because I, I do think it's a really central one. Um, so, so the first one is just reverse causality. That was, uh, you know, John Cochran's first, you know, first direct point. And so what we're going to do to rule that out is to not just look at people's networks today, but what we want to do is we want to focus on the high school friendships that people have but we want to tag people not by their own income today, but by their parental income. So we, you know, we're going to try and link individuals to their parents, and we're going to look at whether or not their parents are a high or low SES. And so here, what we're me measuring is: are children from low SES families connected to children from high SES families? And we we measure that you know, using, um, using Facebook data for the same cohort as we measure economic mobility. Um, we also produce a separate measure of economic connectedness of today's youth using Instagram data, um, you know, and, um, and all of the results look very, very similar, which make us think that sort of the more simple, um, you know, um, just reverse causality story, those places, you know, that it's the economic mobility that itself raises economic connectedness um, in, in the way we measure it is really not driving what's going on. Um, a second sort of, you know, non-causal mechanism that you might worry about and you should worry about is some sort of degree of selection, right? So the idea here is that it could just be that low SES people in areas with high economic connectedness might just be fundamentally different. And that this explains, you know, the higher upward mobility, right? So you could imagine that, you know, if you went to Escondido village and you looked at, you know, and, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the individuals in Escondido village would look like low income individuals because they're graduate students. Escondido village is the graduate housing um, complex on, at, you know, on the Stanford campus. Um, was, was, was. Was, no longer? Was, no, torn, <laughs> torn down. Oh, poor. You know, it's like breaking my heart, Bob. <laughs> Just tell um, the truth. Um, you know, and the, those so those would be places where you know the the low income individuals would um, would have very high upward income mobility because you know they're poor while they're graduate students, but you know they're likely to become uh, you know to, to 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 become relatively you know uh, wealthy or you know high earning individuals down the road. And so it might just be that also graduate students have lots of links to rich people. Right, because you know a lot of the undergraduate college friends who didn't end up going to uh, graduate school went straight to Wall Street, and so making a lot of money and are rich and so on. So it could just be again that the low SES people in high connected areas are fundamentally different. And so what we're going to do to to kind of address that point is that we're not just going to look at what we call observed upward income mobility. This question, you know, someone who's par you know who who uh, you know who's poor and rises up the income distribution, but we're going to look at an at an earlier measure that um, the Opportunity Insights team created um, a causal measure of economic mobility. And basically the idea here was that they were exploiting movers across space and trying to basically look at families with multiple kids that move across space and the kids are different ages and therefore different, you know, exposed to these different neighborhoods for differential lengths of time. And um, using that to estimate the causal effect of a given neighborhood on upward income mobility. Um, and you know, we get very, very similar results in that causal analysis. Um, the most important one, I think, and it does keep coming up, and so I want to like go straight there, is this question of omitted variables, right? Are those areas where economic connectedness is high, are they also different on other characteristics? And maybe it is those other characteristics that are driving what we observe in the data. You know, and here you could think about you know, a variety of neighborhood characteristics that have been documented to, um, you know, to, to affect income mobility, you know, poverty rates, racial segregation, 
inequality. This is Alan Kruger's, you know, Great Gatsby curve that areas with more, you know, income inequality within a generation have less income ability across generations. Um, and so the question then is, are we really picking up the effect of economic connectedness or are we picking up the effects of some of these other characteristics? And so I'm going to focus on just one of these uh, other characteristics next, which is just average neighborhood incomes. Right? People have shown before that in richer areas, lower income people have higher upward mobility. You know, and, and, and this is the reason why, you know, in all of these moving to opportunity studies, poverty rates are used as the main target of neighborhoods out of which, you know, where you want to move people out of. Um, so I want to build up this graph here to really kind of highlight the point that it is not neighborhood incomes that matter, but that it is economic connectedness that matters. So what I'm showing you here is, you know, every point is a zip code in the United States. And what I'm plotting on the horizontal axis is median household income in that zip code. And what I'm plotting on the vertical axis is economic connectedness in that zip code. Um, and what you can see is there's this strong upward relationship here, right? This is kind of you know, what, 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 what uh, various you know, of you have pointed out, areas where there's just more rich people around. It's easier for, um, for, for, for lower income individuals to have more rich friends. But the other thing that you see is that, you know, holding income fixed, there's actually quite a lot of dispersion in, you know, the, the, the share of rich friends that poor people have. This was my answer to John Cochran's question earlier on. He said, isn't this just a map of income? And I said, sure, it's a map of income. That's sort of the upward correlation that you observe here. It's strongly correlated with income. But in addition to that, you actually have quite a lot of variation in economic connectedness conditional on income. And so now we can ask the question, well, what is it? Is it the variation in income that drives economic mobility? So this is going left to right in this graph. Or is it the variation in economic connectedness that's driving you know, upward income mobility, which is sort of going up and down in this graph? So in order to do that, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to color these dots by upward income mobility in the zip code. So the red dots are areas with low upward income mobility, and the blue dots are areas with high upward income ability. And what you can do here in some sense is a graphical decomposition, uh, you know, analogous to a multivariate regression analysis. Because what you can do is you can, on the one hand, focus on sort of vertical slips of this graph, areas with very similar incomes, but very different degrees of economic connectedness. And what you see is if you go from low to high here, from low economic connectedness to high economic connectedness, holding income fixed, holding resources, et cetera, in the neighborhood fixed, income mobility goes up quite a lot. On the flip side, when you look at horizontal slices of this graph, these are areas that have pretty similar economic connectedness, but vastly different income levels. What you find is that really, you know, change, variation in income levels has very little effect on this economic mobility measure, um, you know, if you don't also generate more economic connectedness, right? So in some sense, you can think of this graph as just a you know, graphical representation of a multivariate regression analysis. And in fact, we do in the paper also do multivariate regression analysis. And really the key takeaway here is that any other neighborhood characteristic you put in, after you also control for economic connectedness, its effect on mobility disappears entirely. And it seems to be mediated entirely through economic connectedness. Again, another way of saying that is, one of the reasons prior work might have found that higher income neighborhoods provide more upward mobility for low income people living in these higher income neighborhoods is because higher income neighborhoods have on average higher economic connectedness. But if they don't have it, it doesn't help the poor. So just living around rich people doesn't generate higher economic uh, mobility unless you also connect with them, befriend them, you know, and learn their values, get information from them, you know, get, get these sort of other helps that we discussed before. Greg, you had some examples before, and it, it's, I find it very hard to picture a low-income neighborhood with lots of people have rich friends. Are, are there like classic counties that that describe the up and down? Yeah, I mean, look, I I, I think I, you know, I think in some sense, you know, if I go back to this one here, right? I mean, in the lowest-income places, you know, you kind of have this missing top left triangle. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it, you know, it, it like you don't have. Like neighborhoods yeah. with of very very few that have that. So okay. take the fifty k slice. It just mm -hmm. is there is there a story of who's on the top and who's on the bottom? 
Yes, so I'm going to get to that in just a bit, because that's going to be really the next thing, trying to understand why these neighborhoods differ in terms of economic connectedness. Um, let me exactly, let me just kind of quickly end here, because I think this kind of gets to these points, right? So, so you know, in some sense, in the first project that we, that we worked, and it was exactly about this question, it was about, you know, trying to measure these different types of social capital, it turned out one of them was really predictive, you know, in of this economic mobility, this outcome that you know we cared about and we thought was interesting to better understand. Um, and so then, in in sort of the rest of the paper, which actually turned out to be the second paper um, that we ended up publishing today, um, we kind of say, okay, let's now just hone in on economic connectedness. Let's forget about all of these other social capital measures. Let's hone in on economic connectedness and let's answer exactly this question John Cochran has, which is. Why is it high in some places and low in others? What are these places? What are their characteristics? What could be going on here, right? Um, so the way we're going to, and, and so, you know, we're basically going to try and address these questions. Why do the poor have fewer high SES friends than the rich? And in particular, why do the poor have fewer high SES friends in some parts of the country rather than others? What could be going on kind of, you know, as some pointers towards potential, you know, policy implications out of this? Um, so the way we're going to do that conceptually is we're going to distinguish, and I mentioned this before, I'm just going to mention it again briefly, we're going to distinguish two key drivers here. The first one is going to be variation in exposure, um, segregation by income in our communities, right? So it could be that low income people don't have any high income friends from high school because low and high you know, income people or low and high SES people just attend different high schools, right? And so if you have segregation in your social settings by class, Poor people aren't going to be exposed to rich people, and that could be one of the drivers that they're not um, making that many rich friends. But the other thing could be that we're plotting on the right here. It could be friending bias. It could be that poor and rich people actually end up going to the same high schools, but that you know within those high schools they don't actually you know make many across across class friendships, um, and you know most of the friendships stay within within class lines. Um, so what we'll try and do is we'll try and uh, you know and 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 you know first start with one setting, um, say one high school, and we're going to try and decompose the economic connectedness in that high school, the extent to which you know poor people have rich friends, into how exposed poor people are to rich people in that high school and this friending bias term, you know how likely they are to befriend a given rich person. The important thing here is that people, you know, as, as you guys have already pointed out, people make friends in multiple settings, schools churches, neighborhoods, workplaces, etc. Um, and so, um, you know, and, and their exposure or the friending bias may differ substantially across these. And so in order to decompose an individual's overall economic connectedness, you know, what it depends on is how many friends they make in each setting, each of these settings, and then sort of the exposure and friending bias that they encounter in each setting. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and measure that in our data, each of these three objects, the share of friends that different people make in different social settings, the number of rich people that they're exposed to in these settings, and the friending bias that they encounter. Um, we're going to focus on six settings, high schools, colleges, employers, recreational groups, religious groups, and neighborhoods, um, largely because you know, those are settings where we can you know, measure or you know, I, I have some confidence to be able to identify the source of a particular friendship and link it to that specific setting. So what I'm showing you here is rates of exposure to rich people um, by setting. So on the horizontal axis, we have the six different settings. And then in green and yellow, we have um, you know, the, the, the number of, um, in green, we have the number or the, 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 the exposure to rich people of poor people. And in yellow, we have the exposure of rich people to rich people. Firstly, what you can see is that in each one of these settings, the yellow bar is higher than the green bar, right? So that tells you that there is a substantial amount of income segregation across these settings. Rich people go to different high schools than poor people. Um, rich people go to different churches than poor people, etc. Um, the other thing that you can see is that even among poor people, there's quite a lot of variation across different settings in terms of the extent to which they're exposed to rich people. Most importantly, in their neighborhoods, the exposure to rich people is the lowest. This was John Cochran's point, right? Rich and poor people just generally don't live in the same, you know, in the same neighborhoods. Um, and interestingly, the only um, the only setting in which poor people are sort of substantially exposed to rich people is in college. So conditional on going to college, poor people are going to meet rich people in college. But importantly, they're still not as exposed to rich people as rich people are. So poor and rich people still end up going on average to different 
types of college. Okay. So um, so again, across these settings, we can just measure the extent to which you know each each of the poor and the rich people are exposed to rich people in general. Um, what we're measuring here is this friending bias concept. Um, again, what what it means, what green bars mean, is that um, is you know how much disproportionately less are poor people likely to befriend a rich person in those settings relative to the presence of rich people in that setting. And so what you can see is that again in neighborhoods, friending bias is the biggest. So you know even if poor and rich people live in the same neighborhood, the cross class friendships form very little. The one setting where conditional on the mix of people, friendships seem to form almost independent of class lines are religious groups and recreational groups. So poor and rich people, as I showed you before, end up going to different churches on average. But to the extent that a rich person and a poor person are in the same church, they're sort of equally likely to become friends with each other than you know, if they had the same SES. And you find the same in recreational groups. And I think it's an interesting question to which we don't have a very good answer yet of what it is about churches and recreational groups that does foster the substantial degree of friending bias. Anat. Uh, this discussion uh, sort of brings back the topic of, uh, for example, uh, this is in other countries where, you know, we have like a mandatory, you know, army service in Israel where, where it does bring everybody together and it's a very bonding experience and, and whatever, and people do maintain uh, a lot of ties to, to, to people they meet. Uh, in, in army units uh, in, in IDF. And I just wonder if you have any, you have data on, on, on groups of that sort that are kind of, you know, really places where, where bonds are created. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with this. I mean, to be honest, I think this is what is exactly happening in recreational and religious groups. It's just a setting where people come together and they share one important common thing. You know, they play soccer together, They believe in the same in the same God. And so that allows them to bridge it. I think your comment on on um, on on the military is a really important one. It's something, you know, Germany got rid of the draft, you know, just around the time that I was about to get drafted. And, you know, a lot of the debate was exactly around this, you know, people sort of, you know, looking back said, look, I, I thought it was sort of a waste of time. You know, I mean, you kind of hang around the border with the Austrians and there isn't really a ton to do sort of from a purely military perspective, but it is sort of the one time in my life when I made friends that didn't go to college and that that were sort of very different. So I do agree with you that there is, um, you know, that, that it is very plausible that, you know, if you're thinking about you know, ways to create cross, cross class links, things like a military draft has that effect. Now, is that the most effective way to create these cross class links? You know, there's obviously lots of other things, other effects of, of or, you know, of a, of a comprehensive draft. Um, and so, you know, in, in, if I have a bit of time at the end, I might just have some ideas about things that one could do to create these links beyond the draft. But I agree with you, the draft is gonna be important. So, so Jonathan, we don't have too much time, Jonathan. So Perfect. Policy is a big question, you know, vouchers, yeah. all sorts of things. Maybe just a couple comments on that and then. Yes, okay. so I just wanna, exactly. So let me, uh, let, me, uh, let me talk just a little bit about things that you can do to, uh, you know, to reduce, uh, to reduce friending bias. Just things we've seen in the data. And I just wanna maybe just start with this graph here. So we measure, um, you know, we measure friending bias also for every high school in the US. And so, um, and so, what, you know, one of the things we've then done is to try and understand what is it about high schools, you know, that foster a lot of um, economic connectedness through having low friending bias, and what is it about high schools that don't do that? And so, and so here's just one example of something that's you know very local to you guys. I don't know how many of you followed Berkeley High Schools um, over the years. I mean, Berkeley High School in our data, I don't know if I can see it here, is one of the high schools that had, um, you know, you see it down here, one of the highest degrees of friending bias. It was actually a pretty diverse school. If you look at the student body overall, there was a lot of income mixing within the school, um, but the high and the low SES people within Berkeley High didn't really befriend each other. And I think, you know, um, part of that was because of the design within the school that they went about. So, so, so look, today Berkeley High split into these five learning communities, two larger schools and three smaller schools. You know, and it says, look, the movement towards these small programs was meant in part to address racial achievement gaps, but many students feel it's created a segregated school. So basically the idea was you create sub-schools within a school and it ends up that the rich 
and generally white kids end up in one part and the other kids end up in other parts. And so what Berkeley did very recently is, is, is they, you know, they proposed the creation of a ninth grade that, you know, again, I'm just reading from the student newspaper here, the Daily Californian says that places incoming student into intentionally diverse communities. So really saying, you know, rather than creating through tracking or other, other types of mechanisms, a lot of, you know, within school segregation, um, we actually need to be intentional about creating these sort of, you know, uh, uh, more diverse communities. Um, here's another example that I like a lot. Lake Highlands High School in Texas um, is a high school that, you know, was off the charts in terms of friending wise. It really stuck out in the graph when we looked at it. And so we were like talking to people and, and reading around a little bit. And what turned out is that Lake Highlands used to, it, it was a school that was made up of different schools before that got merged into one. And what they did is they kept the duplicate um, facilities. So there is a school that had multiple cafeterias. And, you know, for whatever reason, someone at some point decided it was sensible to only offer free and reduced lunch in one of the cafeterias, but not the others. And you can imagine what happened. You know, all of the, you know, the, the children eligible for free and reduced lunch would hang out in one part of the campus, they would hang out in another part. And so the school noticed this and the principal noticed this. And so they worked together with, uh, you know, with an architecture firm to build a new school where the exact idea was to create these intentional spaces. Um, so, you know, it describes, look, these duplicated rooms led to unintentional student segregation. Um, but, you know, they created this, this, this new building where they really tried to build spaces where everybody would interact, hang out together, and, and sort of facilitate those links. You know, inner city weightlifting is a Boston gym that, um, you know, has, um, you know, has, has designed programs to try and foster these types of links. So the idea is explicitly um, to try and, and create what we call economic connectedness, right? So the idea is you take um, you know, low income, um, you know, uh, students, many of them had, you know, run-ins with the law over time, you train them up and you, you, you have them become the personal train of relatively wealthy people. And, you know, the idea was exactly this. It says, you know, students form relationship with clients from opposite socioeconomic backgrounds, bridging social capital and creating this, you know, support network. Um, you know, it, it, the people that are probably gain access to the new networks and opportunities while our clients gain new insights perspective into complex social challenges. So just another idea of saying, look, let's try and be intentional about creating spaces where these types of, you know, cross-class links, um, you know, can, can, can be fostered. And, you know, I'm, uh, I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm almost out of time. Um, so I want to just do two more slides and then I go just to questions for the rest of what I have today. Um, so as of today, we've released very granular statistics on social capital for every high school, every college, every zip code in the United States. It's on this website that you can see here. It's called the Social Capital Atlas at www.socialcapital.org. I encourage you all to listen, uh, to, to, to look at it. It's fascinating. You can explore lots and lots of things there. And our hope really is that people take this data and they start doing much more of this exploration. What is it about some high schools that makes them sort of create cross-class links that makes them have low friending bias, bias versus others. We found some patterns, but I think, you know, everybody can now look at their own community and see which of the schools in my neighborhood, you know, has these links, which ones does not, what might be going on, what are sort of various things that we could do, um, you know, to, to, to foster these links. And so I want to end here. Um, you know, as I said, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's largely a measurement paper. It is trying to go after these concepts, trying to measure them sort of at, at, at scale and, and at a level of disaggregation that can hopefully then spur further on research to really try and understand what it is about certain schools, certain colleges, certain neighborhoods um, that makes them have these types of cross-class links, which seem to really be the key predictor, at least in a correlational sense. And I think we've ruled out most sort of threats to a causal statement, maybe not enough to, you know, overcome referee concerns, but I think sort of enough to make us feel quite comfortable that economic connectedness really is something that should be studied further, that we want to understand better, and maybe we want to sort of think about how to intentionally create. I'm going to be done now, and maybe we can Thank start you, with... Yeah, with... So we have a question from Leo Hadian and, and Cochran and Davis. Lee. Um, hey, th thanks, Johannes. Um, you know, I, 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 I lost just the internet issues. I lost a little bit of the uh, presentation. So if you covered this already, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just shut up. But um, your presentation brought to mind an old paper by um, 
Mike Keen and Ken Wolpin that in terms of a one-liner, it pretty much said that everything you need to know about males in terms of their economic outcomes as adults is known by about age 15. And that didn't follow for women. So I'm wondering if you're seeing that um, at the gender level or if there's something, <clears throat> if you're seeing something about males that's different or if the kind of data that they looked at, if that can be integrated with, uh, with what you're looking at. Yeah, it, it's a very good question, Lee, and I don't have a good answer. We haven't, you know, we haven't really done the disaggregation by gender. Um, and so I wish I had an answer for you, but it would just be pure speculation. So uh, yeah, I'm leaving it for another talk. Maybe a few years I'll be back and uh, have some thoughts on that. Thanks. Okay, John Cochran. Yeah, but to bring up the elephant in the room that I'm surprised you haven't talked about, which is segregation by race, ethnicity, to some extent religion. I went to a prototype of your high school. It was about 80% black and university professors kids. But of course the white people and black people never talk to each other. In other high schools, the Asians never talk to them, the Mexicans never talk to anyone else. I'm curious to what extent your successful uh, counties, the ones where there is uh, every, everybody's 50 grand, but there's a lot of, uh, of cross friendships are ethnically homogenous in that sense. Yes, yeah. yeah. so you're exactly right. So. Um, one of the things we find, so we, we, we don't observe race at the individual level, but one of the things we find is very much consistent with what you said is that schools and neighborhood where in external administrative data, we can see that they're more racially heterogeneous. Those are places with more friending bias, right? And it's exactly the intuition you have to the extent that race as it does in the US correlates with socioeconomic status. And we know from you know decades of research that and there's a lot of homophily on race. You're going to get that, um, you know, that um, places that are, you know, more, um, you know, more similar in terms of race are going to, on average, have lower friending bias. We see that in the college data too. So the historically, black colleges and universities are some with the lowest friending bias out there, for example. Um, so, so that is something that is true. Now, what is not true? is that that's the key driver for our economic mobility results. So one of the things, for example, we can do is we can look at majority white zip codes. So there's parts of the US where 95% of people are all white. And even variation within those majority white zip codes in terms of economic connectedness, none of which is gonna be driven by any type of homophily on race is, um, you know, is, is, is still equally predictive of differences in economic mobility of low income kids in those zip code as it is when we use the full sample of zip codes. So we don't think the correlation between economic connectedness and economic mobility is driven by some confounder in terms of race. But what we do think is likely going on and, and is in, in many ways unsurprising um, is that areas with um, more you know, racial mixing are actually areas where friending bias ends up being higher on average. Well, it's You're not exactly just right that. There's, there's religion, there's culture, there's the townies versus the smart kids, there's the JD Vance's Ohio, where there's the Appalachians versus the original, you know, people people sort. Anyway, yes. So Steve, Steve Davis, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, thanks, John. It's lots of interesting stuff. Um, I want to go back to the, the the question about values and attitudes and personal responsibility and so on, but put it in a different way. Your, your work also raises the question of when does economic connectedness matter a little bit and when does it matter a lot? So one hypothesis is that it matters a lot for poor people in the United States um, because the popular culture, public education system, maybe their families uh, don't systematically instill an ethic of personal responsibility and appreciation for the value of education, perseverance, and so on. And if, that's, if that hypothesis is correct, then one would see that economic connectedness matters less in societies that do a lot more of that. I think of Singapore, South Korea, some Scandinavian countries, and would also matter a lot less within the United States in demographic groups that I mentioned, you know, immigrant, refugee, refugee immigrants earlier um, that seem to be successful at doing that within the family unit. So I think there, it's really interesting, partly on its own sake, for its own sake, but partly to understand better the mechanisms behind your 
connection yep. between economic connectedness and where people end up in the income dis distribution <laughs> to yeah, explore no. where economic connectedness has big effects and where it has small effects. Yeah. So no, Bob, I, I, I agree. Bob, I agree. Sorry. Sorry, John. Hey, Bob, ask you a question, then Johannes can finish. Go ahead, okay. Bob. So, so it seems like you're showing off, Johannes, you're showing off some amazing data and and some good questions, but you don't have any results yet that would stand up. You need some econometrics. Um, I didn't, the question of identification, which, which, which was discussed, but never identified. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, that, that's, you, you gotta, you gotta, this reminds me of macro. Uh, when I entered the macro profession, uh, macro was very similar. You know, there's, you regress this X on Y or, you know, or C on Y. Um, and then you announce a result and you get a, and, and, you, and you get some scatter plots and stuff. Um, and then Robert Lucas, more than anyone else came along and brought order to this by saying, you gotta have models, you gotta have assumptions, you gotta especially you have to worry about identification. Uh, and, then, and then macro became a science uh, in the 1970s. So, so you're, you're but it's, it's time to get serious with the econometrics now that yeah i mean I, I don't think i mean I, I think for your fundamental concern as you know well bob because you taught me this econometrics isn't the solution econometrics provides you no identification right so and so, <laughs> so um <laughs> your brain so your brain so, uh, so I, I don't think i don't think we need more econometrics i do think what we need well, and i and i hope this is a starting point for is you know more causal work in this space Right, yeah, and I exactly. think okay. yeah, that's I, another I, way of putting it. Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm completely, I'm completely on board with that. I think, but you, know, you need something that, that you need something that so, a referee would respect as a result, and you don't. Well, I mean, we, we got yeah. we got some referees convinced for this result so far, so I'm, <laughs> you know, I suspect I suspect there's also a little more in the paper than I had time to go through in, in you know, in the discussion. Um, but look, I think I think your point is fundamentally well taken, which is that you know we really view this as the beginning rather than the end of you know what's going to take us and 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 many others um a lot of time to really work out um you know as as you know jack goldston has said earlier on right this has been decades of theory in terms of why these things might matter and you know this is really in many ways for the first time bringing at scale data to measure this and i don't think we fully understood the exact mechanisms for why economic connectedness is at least in a correlational sense linked to outcomes. You know, uh, uh, you know, Steve likes the interpretation of values, and you know, other people prefer the interpretation of information or prefer the interpretation of, um, you know, of, of, of direct, you know, job referrals, etc. Those are all open questions. Um, you know, it might still be possible that there is no causal link. Again, you know, I think by addressing reverse causality, by addressing selection, and by addressing confounders, you know, as we did in the presentation um, today, and we do more in the paper, I think we go some way towards being a little more comfortable about making causal statements here, but even then more work is required. So I think, you know, the, our ability now to measure these concepts at scale I think at least brings some hope to be able to make progress also on these other dimensions next. And you know, as I said, I, I don't think this is a settled issue. I think this is just just the beginning. But I do think the correlations are striking enough to at least make me think it's worth spending the next five years of my research career really trying to dig into this and 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 hoping to make further progress because I do think, you know, in some sense, it, it, you know, it is the essence of the American dream that everybody can rise up the income distribution. And it is something that has declined over time and that is very, very low in many parts of the country. And we've not had much insight into why that is. And this seems to be, you know, both from sort of the theoretical motivation that the sociologists have provided, as well as pretty striking empirical patterns, seems to be a pretty promising candidate. Um, and in a nice way, it is something that community by community, you can do something about. Right? Reducing friending bias is something that every high school can think about, every college principal can think about. What can I do to reduce friending bias in this setting and that setting? And it's also something that, quite frankly, in a pretty divided, polarized political environment, it's one of the things that I think everybody can still agree on, 
that upward income mobility is something desirable. The American dream is something desirable. And so, you know, the combination of, you know, people agreeing that the outcome is desirable, as well as, you know, there being sort of the hope for actionable, you know, actionable policies at the local community level, again, makes me think that this is something worthwhile spending more time thinking about. Again, we're not done. And the hope is that by releasing the data, we're going to get lots of you also on board saying, hey, you know, maybe I can think a little bit about what could be going on here now that we can measure this better. Because, you know, even though we're, what, nearly 40 co-authors on this paper, you know, something like that, um, you know, there's a, a limit to our bandwidth too. And so we're following in a little bit like Steve Davis's you know, approach, you measure these things, you put them out, and then you get lots of people helping in the in the enterprise of uh, of explaining, you know, whether or not it's policy uncertainty, and in our case, um, you know, social capital. Johannes, thank you so much. It's so informative, and we're going to come back many times, not just five years. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for your time.